All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Robert Moyeda, and I'm the meteorologist in charge at the National Weather Service Miami Forecast Office. And uh, welcome to the 2024 South Florida wet season outlook. You know, we, something that we do every year. Obviously, I know a lot of you have uh, taken part or have uh, you know, be, been either here in person or viewing virtually. Uh, so we do these for the wet season outlook, as well as for the dry season outlook that we do uh, in the fall. So uh, thank you everyone for, for being a part of this, both in person and virtually. Um, we do have the chat room open if you have any questions, but keep in mind that we, we will, oh, whoop, hang on, I'm muted, one, one second. Sorry about that, I'm gonna repeat that again. Thank you very much, yeah. That, the last thing I didn't do was unmute myself, so. All right, once again, uh, apologize for the delay. My name is Robert Moyeda, Warning Coordination Meteorologist with, I'm sorry, wrong title. Meteorologist in charge. Okay, I got a new position, so forgive me for, for forgetting. It's 18 years, you know, it's been a long in that position. It's hard to break that habit. So um, I'm with the National Weather Service Miami Forecast Office, and this is the uh, South Florida 2024 wet season outlook, something that we do uh, every year. We do the wet season outlook usually in May, and then we also do a dry season outlook uh, in the fall, usually late October, early November timeframe. So Thanks for thanks everyone for being here. Uh, as we've done for the last for quite a few years now, we this is a partnership with the South Florida Water Management District. So joining me today is Matahel Ansar. He is the section chief of the Applied Hydraulic Section at the South Florida Water Management District, and he will present after my slides. He will present the uh, the outlook from the water management side. So. Again, if you have uh, any questions or anything you wanna bring up, uh, there will be opportunities uh, afterwards to ask or if you either ask you know, or you can type them in on, on the chat. Okay, so with that, we're going to get started. All right, so just a recap of the dry season. We're still not quite to the end yet. Uh, wet, wet season starts on May 15th, so we still have a few more days to go before the official end of the dry season and the official start of the rainy season. So uh, most of this dry season was wetter than normal. We had a, the El Nino pattern that was in place from last fall all the way through the winter and still going on now. That played a, a fairly big role in the increased precipitation, at least compared to normal uh, across most of South Florida. So we had several storm systems, especially during the December, January, and February timeframe. And those, those gave us a you know, decent amount of rainfall across much of the area. Now, over the last two to two and a half months, basically from, from about March to the current time, we have gone to a drier than normal pattern. Uh, and this is something that's not unusual. We see this really practically every dry season, except maybe just a few. Uh, there's always a period of where it's gonna be pretty dry the hence the, the the dry season of course but dry enough that we could start getting into some uh, drought like conditions and then from a temperature standpoint uh, the winter of 23 24 december through february what temperatures were close to the norm close to the normal to the we, we have a 30-year normal so those the winter temperatures actually ended up being right near those normals and that was actually the coolest winter since 2014 2015 so we've been you know, since 2014, 2015, we've had above normal uh, temperatures each winter, and this winter we actually ended up uh, being much closer to normal. So a uh, graphical depiction of the rainfall basically from October 15th, from the beginning of the dry season to over the weekend here, this past weekend, uh, the green colors are, 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 the green and blue are indication of above normal precipitation for that time frame. So. Uh, with values as much as 20 to 30 percent above the normal for that uh, near seven month time frame. Now, areas around Lake Okeechobee uh, and around yeah, areas around Lake Okeechobee and even the parts of Palm Beach County and also areas north of Lake Okeechobee, uh, even though they did have a wet, wetter than normal winter, the drying trend, this more recent drying trend, has been a little more pronounced there. So they actually, in, in the whole balance of things there, they're actually a little bit below normal, but not by much. We're talking still 80 to 80 to 90% of normal 
across some of those areas. So not 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 too much below normal. So the you know the the near to above normal, especially the above normal precipitation. Again, that's a characteristic of El, of El Nino, and then the late season dryness that we're experiencing now is similar to some of the past years when we've had the transition from El Nino to what we expect to be La Nina by the time we get here to the, to the summer. So we'll talk more about that here coming up now. So as a result of this, this recent dryness, uh, we, we do have abnormal, I'm sorry, we have moderate drought conditions now from Northern Palm Beach County over Lake Okeechobee and then up the Treasure Coast even up into parts of Brevard County with abnormally dry conditions, not still like, like you could say like a pre-drought uh, from over most of the other parts of South Florida, mainly from um, about Northern Broward County northward. So again, this is not unusual. In fact, most, most dry seasons, we end up in at least some type of drought condition before the rainy season pattern kicks in. So, th so, this we, so we got a late, later than normal start to this uh, drought-like pattern. All right, so let's go to the outlook for the rainy season. So just, uh, I know we show this with every, every time, every year that we do this. Uh, you know, our rainy season is May 15th to October 15th. That's, you know, it was, it was defined uh, back in 2018. So it's, you know, it's characterized, of course, by daily or near daily showers and thunderstorms, which can be anywhere from, you know, or over the water, you know, over our coastal waters, and then it can also, of course, form in the afternoon over the interior por portions of the peninsula. And it's also characterized by daily high temperatures in the upper 80s and 90s, lows in the 70s to near 80s. So basically, you know, near constant high dew point levels in the 70s. So it's, again, our rainy season here. And again, that's, so these high levels of moisture are or will help to trigger the showers and thunderstorms that we get on a near daily basis across, across the peninsula and the adjacent waters. So again, this is the uh, the rainy season start and end, May fifteenth to October fifteenth. Uh, so it's we went back, uh, you know, many many years when we've subjectively calculated the beginning and end dates. So based on the the median of those of subjective start dates that we analyzed, we went back and analyzed. We determined what we thought what we think is a pretty good representation uh, of the start and end that we could use every year for people, you know, for people to, in other words, define a season that we can use to, to help um, as far as getting prepared uh, for rainy season, you know, giving people a little bit of advance notice of that. Just, just like, you know, what we do with hurricane season. Everybody, you know, hurricane season, of course, is June 1st to November 30th, but, you know, we can get storms forming before June 1. And just like with this, with the rainy season, the rainy season pattern can start earlier, before March 15th, or it could start after. Uh, well after March, uh, May, May 15th at times. So, you know, without going too much into detail on this, essentially one of the, the hallmarks of the beginning of the rainy season in South Florida is an, an increase in atmospheric moisture, which, you know, that's what obviously what we need to help to form those clouds and, and thunderstorms that we get, again, on a near daily basis. So going back through, you know, through our, our weather balloon data, we can see there, you know, historically there is an increase in the atmospheric moisture content or values, once we get to that early to middle part of May, they stay at pretty high levels and then they start to drop off fairly rapidly once we get into the month of October. And we can also look at this in, uh, from the standpoint of what is the median daily rainfall coverage over, over counties, over specific counties across Florida. So this map, this graph shows uh, over a 17-year period in Broward County, what the median daily rainfall coverage is. So this is the percentage of the county uh, observing at least a hundredth of an inch or what we consider to be measurable precipitation. So you can see it um, in the early part of the year, January through early May, those red values are values that are pretty low, like no more than 10 or 20%. But once we get to like the middle part of May, the green lines really start to come up. So that's, so you can see, uh, uh, a commensurate with the moisture increase, we get an increase in rainfall coverage across the area. And that, and these uh, values stay pretty high all the way until we get into the month of October. So again, this is for, you know, the rationale behind those rainy season uh, dates. And same thing for, we picked Collier County as another example. We could have picked any county in South Florida it would be very similar. So again, 
Similar trend on the Southwest Florida coast in Collier County. So this, these are the uh, average or the normal rainfall values that we get during a rainy season. So uh, over the East Coast metro areas of South Florida, anywhere from 40 to 45 inches is considered normal. Uh, in Southwest Florida, a little bit lower, about five inches less, about 35 to 40 inches of rain. And then along the Atlantic beaches, uh, it can actually be even lower. It can be as low as 30 inches or as high as 40 inches. So you can see some sp uh, specific values for some uh, for select locations across South Florida. And, you know, the characteristic of a season, uh, about 60 to 70% of our average yearly rainfall occurs during this five month period. So most of our rain, most of the average yearly rainfall occurs during the rainy season, like in that five month season. So the, the typical, you know, I say if you were to, uh, if you were to describe someone, you know, what's a, what's a rainy season day typically like in South Florida? Well, it's Typically, you know, scattered day-to-day -day showers and thunderstorms uh, may be forming over the waters in the morning and then in the afternoon, those showers and thunderstorms start to develop over the, over the interior of the peninsula where when you have the heating of the land starts to interact with the high levels of moisture and then the sea breezes come in from the Gulf and the Atlantic and help to uh, converge that, that, that hot, humid air over the peninsula. So that's the, the, the typical pattern because a lot of this precipitation tends to be rather scattered in nature, in other words, not covering an entire region at any one time, uh, summer rainfall totals can vary pretty widely from location to location. In fact, even over very short distances, you can see, you know, pretty big differences of 10 inches or even as much as 20 inches of rain, 20 inches of rain difference. And it can, it can vary also within, within the season itself. And so because of that, the long range predictability of summer rainfall is difficult. In other words, for any one location, uh, one location, uh, the, the predictability might be good, or in other words, it, the, the, what we predict might actually verify, and then somewhere not that far away where they had less rainfall, for example, uh, that you know it may, it may not quite be the same for that area. So that's not uncommon at all for most rainy seasons. There, there are three primary, I would say, uh, and these are very generalized. These are not, uh, there's no specific dates that these patterns typically follow. But this is in general what the different phases of the rainy season are. So the, the first, let's say, six weeks or so from the beginning in mid-May through about uh, first week of July, uh, that's typically the stormiest phase when we have the highest frequency of severe thunderstorms, you know, with strong wind gusts, sometimes large hail. Uh, tornadoes even sometimes, and, and flooding. Uh, then, that's, then that can be followed sometime later in July the, by the, the, the hottest and even some dry periods. So the, the, the driest part of the rainy season is typically later in July, sometimes extending even into part of August. And that's uh, due to the subtropical high pressure, which is over the Atlantic, which tends, during that time of year, tends to shift a bit farther west we also can sometimes we get episodes of Saharan dust that can travel across the Atlantic, westward across the Atlantic, and can, can affect South Florida mainly during this time frame. And then following that from mid to late August through the end of the, of the rainy season, that's the time of year when the precipitation can vary quite a bit. It's highly dependent on any tropical systems. Of course, we know uh, August, September, and October is the peak of hurricane season. And also we start getting some early season fronts uh, that start coming into our area September and especially in October. So that can lead to widely varying uh, rainfall amounts. We can get uh, pretty significant rainfall with these events, but in the absence of those, sometimes we may, we may not get much. So that's kind of the, the again, the three phases. Um, with the mention that the first, that early phase is the stormiest pattern. So that's the peak of severe weather season, if you want to call it that, is usually May through July. And that's, then these are the total severe weather reports uh, across all of South Florida that we've gathered over the years, you know, going back into the late 1950s. So again, historically, that's when we typically, typically see the greatest or the highest frequency of severe thunderstorms, you know, large hail, gusty winds, even tornadoes. All right, so let's talk now about the large scale global patterns, which you know we always talk about, for example, El Nino, La Nina, and how they tie in to this outlook. 
So as I mentioned before, uh, we're still in an El Nino pattern. This El Nino started la uh, last fall, or yeah, late last summer and in the fall. Um, but uh, if you look at the right side of each of these different graphics here, so these, these graphics co correspond to different sections of the tropical Pacific Ocean. And so we monitor the sea surface temperatures in each of those areas and how, they're res how, how those sea surface temperatures are compared to normal. So the orange values indicate warmer than normal waters in the tropical Pacific Ocean. But notice over the last couple of months here, like March and April, these values are starting to go down. So as they get down below this line here, then they start going down into negative territory, which is cooler than normal waters. So in fact, in one of the areas here, right off of South America, we're already seeing cooler than normal waters show up. That's what we feel is the beginning of the emerging La Nina pattern, which is likely to uh, occur by the time we get later here in the summer, and especially by the time we're, we're in, the, uh, in the peak of hurricane season. So these are the probabilities from, from different models of what phase we're gonna be in, whether it's La Nina or El Nino, again, linked to those water temperatures in the tropical Pacific. So the latest probabilities are for about 60% chance that we'll be in a La Nina pattern by the June to August period, and then near 80% for the August, September, and October period. So likely chances. And uh, the El Nino La Nina is tied into what we call the El Nino Southern Oscillation. It's a varying cycle of warmer and cooler than normal waters, you know, which, are, which are influenced by uh, wind patterns across the tropical Pacific, and those in turn affect the water temperatures, or it can influence the water temperatures over that area. So you can see if you go back at least like the last decade or so, uh, the blues are La Nina periods and the reds are El Nino. So you can see it, they do alternate back and forth. Now, there, there was a period from 2020 to 2023 when we were pretty solidly in La Nina. And then we had the, the, the one break, I guess, if you will, a break from La Nina, at least last winter, which we were in El Nino, but now we're going back to La Nina. So another thing that we look at is how, how well defined the La Nina pattern uh, could be based on, in other words, what the temperature trends could be in the tropical, uh, tropical Pacific Ocean. So the, the farther down on this graph, the cooler the waters uh, are, at least these models are depicting, compared to the average. So most, the, the, the consensus of, the, of these, all of these different models show values maybe around close to about one degree Celsius below normal or cooler than normal by the time we get to the uh, uh, September, October, November timeframe. So that, if, if that, let's say, if that verifies, let's say if it's around one degree Celsius, that's what's considered to be right on the threshold of a moderate La Nina event. If it was, if it was greater than 1.5 degrees below normal, then that would be a strong event. So right now, it looks like most of the models are indicating a weak to a moderate La Nina. So that, that, that can be a factor. Uh, when it comes to uh, not just local weather patterns, but also, you know, larger scale patterns as well. So when we do these predictions, uh, we're looking at the, the El Nino, La Nina, which we just showed. So the Climate Prediction Center, which is the uh, NOAA's, Na NOAA's national center that does the seasonal outlooks, they also look at long range models. And we also look at trends. In other words, what have we seen over the last 10 to 20 years? And then finally, uh, we look at analogs or past years with similar preseason conditions or conditions leading up to the start of, uh, of the rainy season. So from the model standpoint, uh, the long range models indicate, uh, at least for the first part of the, for, of the rainy season, uh, equal chances of above or below normal rainfall. So they're not really giving us a very high level of confidence in whether we're gonna be above or below normal. Now, by the time we get to the August, September, October period, which is the, the picture on the right, the map on the right, there the, 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 the likelihood increases of above normal precipitation, again, according to these long range uh, models that, you know, that are used for climate prediction. Uh, from a temperature standpoint, it looks pretty similar from early to late season. Uh, 
high likelihood, high probability, in fact, 90% or greater from the models of above normal temperatures throughout the entire rainy season and throughout the entire summer. Okay, so now we look at the trends. In other words, the last 10 to 20 years or so. So when we divide up the area, so we'll show, like this is the Southeast Florida region. These are the summer temperatures going all the way back to the late 1800s or late 1890s when we started to have you know, uh, records of temperatures here in this area. But really what we're looking at here is this, this period right over here on the far right side, those red colors. What it's showing is that the, the trends have been for uh, hotter than normal summers, uh, really going all the way back to 1990 and you know, continuing uh, all the way through this day. So the trends are definitely pointing at uh, above normal temperatures. Um, precipitation, it is showing a little bit of a trend, a bit of a trend towards above normal rainfall over the last, let's say, uh, 30, 40 years or so, but with a little bit more variability. Notice these greens, which are above normal rainfall, are not extending up as much, and there is some up and down or some variability in some of these uh, values. So the precipitation trends are not as clearly defined as the temperature trends. Um, same thing if we switch over to southwest Florida, same trends for temperature, and also similar trends for precipitation. But again, without much, you know, with a bit more variability in the precipitation, uh, with summer precipitation, especially over the last, again, uh, 20, 30 years or so. So that's, so that's the trends. Okay, then what we then for the, the last piece of the puzzle is we go back to past years when we had La Nina. So in other words, past La Nina events, uh, what were the temperature and rainfall trends? So these boxes are basically the, the distribution of precipitation values for the El Nino pattern, the neutral or neither El Nino or La Nina, and then finally for La Nina. So if you, this is for the first part of the rainy season, May through July. So notice the La Nina is, those temp the, the precipitation values are a little bit lower than what we've seen in past, in, su in summers when we've had neutral and El Nino. So that kind of supports in some way the, uh, what the models are indicating as far as equal chances. In other words, we're getting a little bit of a, of a conflicting signal between the trends, the models, and what we've seen in past La Nina years. Now, by the time we get to the latter part, the second half of the rainy season, August, September, October, then the La Nina precipitation tends to be rather equal to the El Nino years, uh, maybe not as high as what we've gotten in neutral years. So we do the same thing for uh, temperature. So for temperature, actually, La Nina and past La Nina events, we've trended a little bit below, lower than, the, than in either of the other two phases. And then for the second half of the, of the wet season, we go up a little bit higher. Okay, so this is just based on past years. So the trick here is putting this all together and that's what the, you know, the Climate Prediction Center, their job is to put all this data together and then do the outlook based on that. So putting it all together, uh, this is the outlook for this month for what's basically what's left of this month. And uh, it is showing, at least the Climate Prediction Center is showing leaning uh, drier than normal. So to begin the rainy season, now we do expect to have a little, I think it looks like an increase in rainfall perhaps next week. Uh, but that could still be followed by some drier periods until maybe we finally set in into a more defined rainy season pattern. And then for temperatures for the rest of this month, likely above normal temperatures. Now, going to the June, July, August period, then we start getting into, for precipitation, equal chances across South Florida. So in other words, what this means is that we're not really leaning one way or the other. We're saying, well, there's equal chances that it could be above normal, below normal, or even near normal. Just to our north or north of Lake Okeechobee, there is a little bit of a, maybe a little increased likelihood of above normal precipitation. Again, not very high, but maybe leading a little more in that direction. Uh, temperatures though, those, we have a little more of a, more of a, uh, more of a lean certainly towards above normal temperatures for the May through July period. Then the August through October period, then we switch over to uh, leaning towards above normal precipitation across the entire Florida Peninsula. 
and also continuing that trend of leaning towards above normal temperatures. So that's the outlook from the, from the National Weather Service based on all these tools that we just described. So the outlook is for this late season dryness that we're currently experiencing could linger into the first few weeks, uh, and that could extend these near or these uh, drought or near drought conditions that we're, you know, that we're having now, depending on how long this dry period could last, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't, you know, wouldn't surprise me if the dry period continues that we could have um, uh, drought conditions even in the, the early part of June. So the outlook for the first part of the rainy season, May through July, equal chances, again, of above normal or near, and then trending towards above normal for the second half of the rainy season. And again, uh, late season rainfall is largely dependent on these tropical systems and these early season fronts that could affect our area. So our flood risk is considered to be average. You know, in an average summer, we, we are gonna have some flood episodes just due to the, the nature of the rainfall and the heavy, potentially heavy nature of some of our rainfall. But the overall confidence on this, I would say, is low to medium. Again, when, you have, when you're forecasting equal chances, that doesn't really get, you know, that's a reflection of a rather low level of confidence. Now, for temperature, we can be more confident. Again, trend, everything's lining up, the trends, the models, and the uh, past uh, analogs. So, Overall, for the entire, for the length of the wet season, above normal temperatures, it's really hard to pin down how much above average the temperatures could be. Some of the models are indicating about one to one, one and a half degrees above normal, but it could, it could very well be more than that, or maybe it could be a little less than that. But above normal, we're pretty confident of that, uh, medium to high level of confidence uh, on that. And, you know, with, with the warmer waters in the Atlantic and especially around Florida, you know, that, you know, we've been hearing a lot about and are still going on, that can contribute to higher, uh, higher nighttime temperatures and also can result in higher moisture levels, which could which translate to high heat index values. So we're going to have to keep an eye on that. Uh, is it going to be as hot as it was last summer? I mean, that's, uh, last summer was a record-breaking summer. I mean, we had never had a summer, at least on record, in South Florida that hot. So it's hard to duplicate records, but, you know, can't totally discount that, but it's hard. Again, we're not, for, we're not forecasting a repeat of last year necessarily, but we are, well, we are at least forecasting above normal temperatures. So it's something that we're, you know, we're going to keep, you know, keep a close eye on. Of course, uh, we can't forget about hurricanes. Hurricane season uh, is coming up on June 1st. This week is National Hurricane Preparedness Week. So, you know, this is a good time to, uh, you know, for people to, you know, go over, their, go over their hurricane plan, learn about, you know, hurricane preparedness or, you know, time to start, you know, doing those things that we need to do, right, to get ready for, for hurricane season. So there's been a lot of talk, of course, about some of these early outlooks that we're seeing from other agencies that are indicating a, a active year. And La Nina, one of the uh, one of the factors of La Nina is it does tend to lead to conditions that are conducive for increased storms to form in the Atlantic Basin. Again, tropical storms and hurricanes. But we do need to remember, though, that there, we really don't have much skill in predicting individual storm formation and the tracks of these storms months in advance. So the seasonal forecasts are not local forecasts. It's a, it's a forecast of what we could expect as far as number of storms over the entire Atlantic Basin, that large area from the west coast of Africa all the way across to, uh, to North America. In fact, trying to localize you know, the, these, uh, these seasonal outlooks, especially as, it, as, as, it, as they pertain to the ENSO, to the El Nino or La Nina phase, can be rather tricky because this is the South Florida tropical storm hurricane landfalls per year by phase of, of ENSO, right? So since 1950. So for, for La Nina, which is the left bar here, uh, the, the, the landfall frequency for tropical storms and hurricanes is, not, is only a little bit higher than it is for El Nino, which is the opposite phase. It's actually highest when we're in a neutral pattern. Again, we're bringing it down to a very local level. So the point I'm trying to make here is, is that what determines whether a specific area gets hit by a tropical system depends on many other factors 
uh, you know, uh, that are regional in, in scale, sometimes even localized, that cannot be predicted or are not always directly tied into that larger La Nina or El Nino pattern. So the bottom line is we are in a hurricane-prone region. So this, this alone is really the reason why we need to be ready every year. This is, our, this is the history of hurricane landfalls uh, going back to 1865 across South Florida. So this is, this is why we need to be ready every year. And really, you know, we're not recommending anything different this year, whether, you know, whether it's La Nina or El Nino, we always have the same message. You know, we need to be ready for hurricane season every single year. So I'm not going to go over these stats in much detail. So, you know, of course, lightning is a big concern during your rainy season. Thunderstorms, of course, produce lightning. Uh, we talked about the tornadoes and severe thunderstorms, uh, flooding. And then we also get a lot of water spouts uh, over our near shore waters. You know, most of the water spouts we get during the year occur during the rainy season. So, you know, we're, we're not an area that, and you're here in South Florida, that's typically known as uh, as uh getting tornadoes, but they do happen from time to time. I mean, we act, Florida actually ranks fairly high up in the list as far as average number of tornadoes per state per year. So, you know, certainly we need to always keep in mind, uh, you know, tornado safety is always important. So those warnings, those tornado warnings, if you have one in effect for your area, you receive that alert of a warning in your area, that means you need to take shelter, go indoors. Same thing for lightning. Now, we don't issue lightning alerts per se, but there are uh, lightning detection systems uh, uh, in many parks, for example, schools, golf courses, et cetera, that do give alerts so when there's lightning de detected somewhere in the area. Let's say usually it's like within like an eight mile radius. So when those alerts go off or when you hear thunder, that's your cue to go indoors. So our, our slogan, is when thunder roars, go indoors. That's the, our lightning safety slogan, very important because here in Florida, we do lead the country in number of lightning strikes and also lightning related deaths and injuries. Flood safety, you know, we wanna make sure that we're not driving into areas of ponded water. You know, most of the flooding here in South Florida is of the ponding variety. In other words, it's not rapidly moving water, but it's water that's rapidly accumulating due to the extremely high rainfall rates. So we want to make sure if water is covering a roadway, do not assume it's shallow enough to go in. So the main message here is turn around. If you see a, a flooded roadway and you don't know how deep that water is, turn around, don't drown. And of course, we talked about hurricanes and tropical storms. With the peak of the season, of course, the beginning of the season in June, June 1, and it peaks in the August, September, and October timeframe. We also get rip currents common during the summer months, especially uh, during our holiday weekends, primarily Memorial Day weekend, and also on the July 4th timeframe, uh, and also Labor Day weekend later in the season. Uh, we, have, we have had an increase in rip current in the past, at least, an increase in rip current uh, casualties due to you know, the amount of people uh, at the beach and in the water coinciding with conditions that are conducive for rip currents to form. And then heat, of course, uh, we talked about the July, August period typically being the hottest, but any, any part of the rainy, any part of the wet season from May all the way to October, we can have heat index values that can sometimes reach or even exceed, well exceed 100 degrees. So that's, that, those are levels that increase the risk of heat illness. One of the things that we always like to you know, mention, and we hear this some, you know, a lot in other venues as well, is uh, you know, beat the heat, check the back seat. So make sure that there, you know, there's no one in the back seat, that you, um, that you always check to see for, for children, pets that are unattended in vehicles, make sure, that, you know, make sure that they're not in the car. Don't assume even if you crack the window open a little bit, that's, that's gonna help because the temperatures can increase dramatically inside of a car. Even with a little bit of the window cracked, temperatures can rapidly reach deadly values. And also a good reminder for people that are outdoors, you know, job sites, uh, you know, if you're just people working outside or exercising, limit activities, especially on those really hot days. So yes, it is hot here pretty much all summer but we can't take that for granted. Even an average summer day in South Florida, the, 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 the temperatures are dangerous enough if you don't take the precautions that you, you, could, you could get heat on this. And we have some new tools 
that we're assessing to assess heat and the heat risk or the day or the uh, the threat or from heat illness. So that's something that we're going to be rolling out. Or actually, we're going to be uh, uh, showing and rolling out here as we get here through the summer. And finally, uh, rip currents. Rip currents historically actually is the leading weather killer uh, in South Florida. Recently, we've had a, a bit of a uh, th th there's been a decrease in the number of rip current fatalities, and I think that's largely in part to the great work that the lifeguards do at the beaches and also greater community awareness. But we don't want to, you know, we still want to make sure that we continue to practice rip current safety. So the number one message is always swim at guarded beaches and always heed the advice of lifeguards. Uh, if you swim at a guarded beach, the chances of, of the chances of being a rip current victim are very, very low. All right, so that does it for my part of the presentation. So now I will call up uh, Matahel. So he'll come up here from the South Florida Water Management District and he'll present the water conditions summary and outlook for this rainy season. Good morning. Um, thank you, Robert, for having us. Uh, what a great facility. Now I know where to be. Next time there is a cut five threatening the region. So it's just a wonderful place. Thank you for having us. So I'm gonna give you a water condition summary, uh, essentially talk to you about what are the water levels we have in our system, in our lakes, and what we're doing to prepare for the wet season. I'm gonna start with uh, essentially the rainfall. Um, I'm gonna actually focus on 2023 and 2024, uh, basically the 2023 wet season and the 2023, 2024 dry season. Uh, what I'm showing here is basically monthly rainfall from uh, November 2022 all the way to, to May 2024. 2020, Any uh, plot here where you're seeing a dark blue, that means we have a surplus of rainfall. Uh, where you have red, that means we have a deficit. Uh, again, looking at uh, the wet season, this past wet season, we're just slightly above normal, about 8% uh, above normal. And that was mainly because May, June, uh, and September were slightly above normal, and July and August were below normal. And then moving on to the dry season, uh, it started really on a dry spell in October where uh, we were seeing a deficit, deficit of 2.10 inches. Uh, and then it was mainly above normal uh, from November all the way to March. Uh, that was really getting to a point where it was getting worrisome in that the rainfall was a lot more above normal. But then April came, we got that uh, dry spell again uh, in April, this month that just passed. And that kind of balanced out things a little bit, not as much as the previous uh, uh, wet season, but we are seeing mainly uh, about 20% above normal for the dry season. What that means essentially is that you'll have some lakes, some areas where you'll have some, some high water, but not terribly high, and I'll show those uh, in a second. But uh, bottom line is uh, we had uh, a wet, dry season, for, for lack of a better word. But um, the, the lake system are looking good despite all those challenges. Um, more on the rainfall, what I showed earlier was uh, on a regional scale. Now I'm going to get into basin by basin what's going on. Some of this is repeat to what Robert showed earlier. Uh, the plot you have on the left here is mainly uh, April last month. Again, like I said, that helped us out a lot because it was b well below normal. Uh, all this uh, dark khaki, light khaki color are uh, anywhere between 20% to 89% of, of normal. And you'll see that for April, almost all 16 county uh, are, are below normal. And you look at anything above WCA3A and above, uh, you are in the 20% uh, to maybe 50% of normal. And then as you go south, it's still below normal. Again, we're talking about just last month. Uh, I think Robert showed this slide earlier. Again, this this help us out just make those operational decisions, knowing that for the entire dry season, what's going on. Uh, big picture wise, as he mentioned, the gray is mostly at normal. So you see East Kalusahachi, Western uh, East Ag area, and WCA 1, 2 are normal. Upper Kissimmee is also normal. And then anything around Lake O here, north of it are mostly slightly below normal. And then as you go south, that's really where you, you start seeing above no, normal rainfall. Now I'm gonna cover some of the lake stages working my way from uh, the upper end of the system down to the south. 
Um, starting with East Lake Toho, uh, what we typically will pay attention to again is what the water level look like with respect to the regulation schedule. The regulation schedule is basically this red line here. What that is, is basically a line that tell us what kind of operation we should be doing. When we are above that line, we are typically in a flood control operation, meaning we try to move as much water as we can and, and as safely as we can to bring the water level down to that red line. When we are, we are be below that line, we are essentially in water supply operation. Um, and you can see in most of those lakes right now, we are in, in doing water supply operation in, in East Lake Toho. Again, um, the line is coming down nicely. The ultimate objective is really to get the water level down to the lowest point of that red line. Uh, which makes sense. Essentially, what we're trying to do there is build storage in the lakes before the wet season hit us. And once the wet season comes, the, the lakes will start re replenishing. And what you want to see is uh, by the end of the wet season, the lakes are basically topped off. Uh, they are at what we call the winter pool, essentially building uh, that water storage uh, level to, to be used for, for the upcoming dry season. Uh, again, looking at East Lake Toho, it's trending nicely towards that uh, lowest end of the regulation schedule, which, has, which is at 54 and GVD for this particular lake. Looking at Lake, lake Toho, uh, which is just uh, south of the city, city of Kissimmee, that's also trending nicely, getting to that target date of, of June 1st. Uh, lake Kissimmee, uh, again, very similar trend, um, going down towards that minimum level. It's right, uh, almost right at schedule, a little bit below schedule. Uh, lake Istopoga, which is a uh, maybe about 40 minutes northwest of the city of Okeechobee. It's, it's a little bit below schedule. That's because we're doing some water supply releases to uh, some of the basin downstream. Now moving on to Lake Okeechobee. Um, it's obviously the heart of the system itself. I, I know this plot is very busy. What I'm showing here is all the trends, uh, not all the, but a number of trends for, uh, of similar years for what we are experiencing this year. The black trend here is where Leco is this year. We are at a uh, little bit above 14, uh, at 14 or 6, uh, two days ago. I think today is right at 14 or so. Uh, so that's a uh, little bit on the high side for this time of the year. It's not terribly high, but it's, uh, it's a little bit on the high side uh, in that uh, you are uh, about 75 percentile if you look at the long-term trend. But it is similar to uh, some some other years, uh, for, for example, last year we're pretty close to to this uh, level at this time of the year. It was also close to 2016. Um, let's see, another thing we do is we also run um, regional models. Uh, there's a model we call uh, SFWMM, South Florida Water Management Model. It's called it's a two by two, meaning it's a two mile by two mile grid uh, that basically simulate the hydrology of a system. It take rainfall as an input and simulate where the water is going to go and what kind of uh, water level to expect uh, in, in, in our canals, in our lakes. Uh, that model basically is run uh, once a month at the beginning of a month. Uh, what we do is we run it using current infrastructure, current operation, but we run it using historical rainfall for 40 plus years, I think about 46 years of, uh, of rainfall data, essentially to see how the system would have responded to, the current system would have responded to the historical rainfall. So that information is used to basically come up with statistical projection of where uh, LECO uh, may, may be heading in the next few months. Uh, as we make operational decision, we look at not only the wet season, we, we also look at the following dry season because you want to control the lake for flood control during the wet season, but you also want to make sure as you get into the dry season, you have enough water to, to also address uh, any water supply issues that may come up. Uh, but in short, what it's showing here is uh, this line that give you percentile. For example, the, red, the bottom red line here show you that uh, there is a 5% chance that uh, things will be below that, that line. Uh, and then the same thing, um, the red line up here show there is a 5% chance you'll be above that line. But uh, broadly speaking, we focus more on the center of that, uh, that plot. Uh, the uh, shaded area in orange here shows there's 50% chance that the stage will fall in this range. Uh, what that means is uh, the lake will be really in a desirable range if we, we stay in that middle range there. Um, the lake will be in what we call the base flow or low flow range. Uh, that typically a sweet spot where you don't have uh, too many flood control issues to deal with. You, you won't also have 
flood control issues to deal with. Uh, having said that, like I said, there are still small chances that the lake can get very high. It can be as high as uh, 17 feet in GVD by, uh, I think, late October, and then as low as uh, maybe uh, 10 and a half uh, by late March next year. Uh, again, just depending on the time of the year uh, you are in. So those are more 5% chances as opposed to the 50%. So, uh, so those are a lot smaller. Those extreme can happen, but the likelihood of them happening are, are small. Now, working my way south, um, and I should mention the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers operate um, about 20, maybe 25 structures, ma mainly around some of the major water bodies, and we operate with over 750 so structures. So uh, go, looking at Lake Okeechobee, uh, we typically will be looking at basically what the stages are doing in the lake and uh, work closely with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and we give them some uh, recommendation and uh, they ultimately it's really the core that uh, operate the lake and the water conservation areas. Uh, so on the WCAs, what you're seeing here, WCA1, uh, we are at about 14, uh, 1584 feet uh, NAVD, which is right at schedule, just slightly below schedule. Uh, in WCA2A, slightly above schedule. The reason we are slightly above schedule is we came pretty close to hitting the floor meaning where we stop water supply delivery, but then uh, as we shut down the gates, it pop up a little bit, so it's just slightly above schedule. And then in 3A, we do have a little bit more storage, which is great for this time of the year. We, we are below schedule, as shown by the green line there. Uh, the core has uh, most of a structure around um, discharging from WCA1 to WCA2A closed. Uh, we call them an S10 structure. They also have a S11 structure closed, which is normal for this time of the year. And then the S12, which are the outflow structure from WCA3A, two of them are closed. Uh, again, that, that, those are all operations that you'll expect uh, in late April, early May. Uh, and then you ha uh, we also have the S12, C, and D that are open. So again, no unusual operation, uh, operation that you'll expect this time of the year. And, and the system, again, is, is where we want it to, uh, it to be as far as uh, uh, late, uh, stage in those WCAs. Uh, I think Robert showed this as well, but we typically look at this from a different perspective. Uh, this is, as Robert mentioned, showing uh, abnormally dry south of the lake and northwest of the lake, and then uh, moderate drought northeast. Essentially, that tell us wh where some of the major water supply um, demand may be happening. This is in line with what we're seeing on the ground. We're doing uh, a number of water supply de delivery to the EAA and then uh, Kalusahachi as well as Upper East Coast. Again, this help us just uh, put it all together and figuring out where some of this water need may be happening. Even though we are getting ready for uh, the hurricane season, we are in full water supply mode right now, meaning this is the time of the year where water supply demands are peaking, uh, and around the lake is primarily for ag demand. In uh, upper east coast uh, and lower east coast is mainly to recharge uh, some, of the, uh, some of our uh, a canal system that we typically keep those canals uh, on the upper end of their operating range. The idea behind that is again is to block saltwater intrusion by keeping those uh, canal high for this time of the year. You're preventing saltwater uh, from uh, coming into uh, into into some of the uh, aquifer system that those municipalities are using for for water supply. Uh, another thing we look at is groundwater. Essentially, we look at groundwater for two purposes. One is for the dry time. We, we, we want to make sure that the wells are not to, uh, too low because if, if they get too low, uh, some of the municipality, like I said, we, we run into some water uh, supply issues. You also don't want them to be too high because if, if they are too high for this time of the year, as we get into the wet season, that could uh, present a, a flood risk uh, for some of those areas. So what you're seeing here is uh, every dot you have a, a representative well where we have long-term record of groundwater levels and different color mean different things. Um, the black basically means super wet, meaning it's above 90 percentile. The, the blue here mean it, 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 it is wet in that 76, 90 percentile. Where we really want to be this time of the year mainly is in that green color, the 25 to 75 percentile, meaning you're close to, to normal for this time of the year. And then the orange color here is 10 to 24 percent, and then red is basically I mean you're super dry. Uh, as you can see, most of the wells uh, around the urban areas are in the green color, which is a good thing. It just basically is telling us uh, those wells are uh, 
where they need to be, and then we don't really have a water supply issue, and then we we don't, we're not presenting a flood risk in that those wells are not are not too high either. Um, we also do a number of things to prepare for the wet season. I listed uh, some of the major ones. We complete a pre-season inspection of our flood control asset. We look at our canal system and see if there is any uh, vegetation, any shoaling, anything that debris that need to be removed. We look at our structures, uh, gates, if a gate needs to be overhauled or, or, or do some maintenance on it. We exercise our pump station and make sure they're ready to go. Uh, we're basically wrapping up some of those overhaul uh, and those will be finished uh, by the uh, time the wet season get here. Uh, we also conduct a, a hurricane exercise. We just did one last, last week, May 1st. Essentially, it's a simulated um, hurricane where we uh, exercise our emergency response from deploying damage assessment team uh, to removing debris to doing our inspection. All the things that we do to respond to, to, to storm we exercised that during uh, that one day uh, training and that went really well and that was uh, that was last week we also do what's called a full uh, full mode switch test essentially what that is is uh, because most of our structure are remotely operated we will simulate a scenario where we have a direct hit to our headquarter and essentially uh, simulate uh, uh, us operating the system from a, uh, an alternate location uh, and uh, from that alternate location we'll go ahead and open some gates and, and, and turn on pumps and make sure that we will be able to operate the system uh, even if our headquarters, uh, God forbid, get, get hit by, by a storm. And uh, we, we have done uh, that. So that's, uh, that's a test we do right before the hurricane season. Uh, we also ensure communication lines are open between us and uh, the local government and the 298 district. We operate and maintain the primary system, uh, but we do work with uh, up to 70 Plus, I think about 75 uh, lo uh, local drainage district throughout the 16 county that we serve and hundreds of uh, municipality. This is the time of the year where we update uh, contact list, uh, name of people who are in charge uh, and just make sure we know who we'll be talking to when a, uh, there is an impending storm. When a storm is approaching, we'll actually have conference call pre and post storm to essentially coordinate response. Uh, we'll be basically telling them what we're doing with our system. They will tell us what challenges they may be having. Some of them may be requesting some, some relief. So this is the time where we make sure all those things are, are done ahead of time. So by the time we are in an actual event, uh, everybody knows uh, who, who we'll be talking to from each region. We also do a coordination internally with our scientists, with other agencies, making sure that everybody's lined up as far as our, our operational strategy for the upcoming uh, season and uh, let's see what else. This is my last slide. The, in a nutshell, the, the system is ready for for the season. Uh, our water levels in Upper Chain of Lake, from Orlando area all the way to the city of Okeechobee, are, are all in good shape. Pretty close to regulation schedule. Uh, some of the water bodies south of the lake are a mixed range, meaning they're slightly either above schedule or close to being at schedule. Nothing. Uh, Terribly to be concerned about, but they, they, they are not right where uh, at, at schedule, but they, they are slightly either above or slightly above. Uh, the fact that we had a, a very dry uh, April really helped us out. Um, I, I heard from Robert that May is leaning towards uh, below normal. That, that should help us as well. Right now we are about 20% above normal. If May trend continue, we should get a lot closer to normal by the time June 1st com comes around. Uh, we are seeing some uh, storage in 3A that will help us create some storage for summer rainfall. And we work very closely with the, the court to look for opportunity this season to move as much water south uh, to minimize discharges to, to the estuaries. And uh, I think uh, Major Bell will tell you a little bit more about that. Uh, and of course, a, a direct or indirect impact from a tro tropical storm can, can change things very quick, quickly on us. Uh, we hope for the best, but we plan for all possibility. Thank you. That's all, that's all I have, you know. Okay, thank you, Matahel. And uh, so right now we will open up the uh, an opportunity for questions from folks here in, in the room and also from those of you that are attending online. So uh, I'm going to give the ability for you to unmute your line. So are there any questions for either me or for Matahel uh, regarding any of the information that we provided here today? 
Okay, you can use the questions option there on the, on the menu, uh, or you can also speak. Uh, get, like, I get, like I said, I've given everyone the, the ability to unmute themselves. Any questions from here in the room as well? Yes, we have a question from the room. Yeah, the, the question is, uh, are we going to make any changes to the modified heat advisory and warnings? Uh, yeah, if you recall last year, ahead of last summer, uh, as part of a pilot project with Miami-Dade County, we lowered the heat advisory and excessive heat warning thresholds from uh, by a total of three degrees. So for Miami-Dade County, the threshold for a heat advisory is a, is a heat index of 105. And for a warning, it's 110. For the rest of South Florida, it's 108 for advisory and 113 heat index for a warning. That is expected to continue, or that will continue this year. So we're going to continue that this pilot project with Miami-Dade County. And especially in light of the new the newer tools that we have as well, we're going to be evaluating those, you know, at least in an experimental way to see how they may correlate or how they may be matching up or maybe not matching up with the heat index. But overall, we're gonna continue to the same, the same policy or the same uh, uh, thresholds for this summer for all South Florida, including those lower thresholds for Miami-Dade County. So that includes the advisories and the warnings and also any messaging that we attach to that, whether it's on social media, whether it's on our website, whether it's through email briefings that then of course get, uh, get sent or get distributed to the entire community. Thank you. Okay, any, uh, any other questions from here in the room? Also, any questions from those of you online? Yes, oh, okay. yes. Okay, so before we, uh, before we wrap up here, actually, we still have one more part, and, I would, and it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Major Corey Bell. He's uh, from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Jacksonville District. He's the Deputy Commander for South Florida. So, uh, Corey, you heard Matahel mention the uh, Army Corps of Engineers, and they are also a key component of, of the water management system here in South Florida. So, uh, uh, Major Bell is going to say a few words on behalf of the uh, Army Corps of Engineers. Welcome. Thank you. First, I'd like to thank uh, NOAA, National Weather Service, South Florida Water Management District for this opportunity and trying to lay out some uh, our strategy going into the wet season. So what we're looking at is to continue to make beneficial releases for water supply and water use uh, with no major releases planned. Now, hurricane season is unpredictable. If we do receive a storm that would indicate uh, that we would need to make a release post-storm, we would we take those under consideration. We would make decisions on at that point. Uh, but right now, in the current projection, we're, we're looking, we're probably coming up, maybe come off another foot off the lakes. So we're positioned well as we move into the hurricane season. We're excited for the opportunities that, that we could uh, work together with our partners throughout this uh, wet season. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you, uh, Major Bell. Uh, any questions? Any questions uh, anyone want? Oh, wait, we might have one. Uh, let's take a look here. Okay, no, no questions. Uh, it's okay. So thank you very much. So final opportunity again. While I give everyone a final, maybe a final minute or two to ask any questions, uh, I want to once again thank you all for being here. Thank you to Matahel and to Major Bell uh, for your partnership. Uh, as you you know, as uh, as you saw, and uh, you know, I think you know, Matahel showed it in one of his last slides. Uh, the, 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 there's definitely a partnership between all these, all of our agencies here, because you know it's uh, you know we have the meteorology side, and then we have the hydrology side, which are obviously related and linked, but you know they are their own separate things. So we need to make sure that you know what's what's what the rainfall has fallen and what's you know and. How, that, how water levels respond to that, and then planning appropriately get based on these outlooks. And of course, the outlooks are based on a lot of uncertains, a lot of unknowns. You know, these are outlooks. These are not exact by spot, by location predictions, but it does give folks an opportunity to at least make appropriate plans, taking into account 
uh, the different possibilities. You saw one of the last slides Mata Hell showed was the range of potential Lake Okeechobee levels by the time we get the next spring. It could be anywhere from, what, like 17 feet to like 10 feet. And that's based on historical values. So, you know, what it ends up being as we get closer to the dry season, to the next dry season, then we'll be able to maybe be able to fine tune that a little bit more. But again, keeping in mind, there's always going to be a range of different possibilities. And that's something that we have to plan for and account for and what these outlooks help us to do. All right. So uh, once again, thank you very much for attending. The, the slides will be made available for everyone to see. So I'll send that out via email sometime later today, hopefully. And if you have any questions, there you see our email addresses there on this last slide. So once again, thank you very much and have a great day.